Hello everyone and thanks for watching Edupedia World Videos. This is the second video for the topic of Biot Savart Law and in this video we'll see what happens when a charge or a current exists in a magnetic field. So we saw the analog of Coulomb's law which is Biot Savart Law in the previous lecture and that said that the small amount of magnetic field by any current carrying wire carrying a current of I, the small amount of magnetic field by an element DL a distance r away from it is given by mu naught by 4 pi i times dl cross r by r cube. We also found out how to calculate the direction of magnetic field. A we could do dl cross r and that shows us that it's inside the plane. Another way we could do it is we could curl our thumbs around the current and then our fingers would curl around the direction of magnetic field the direction of magnetic field would be like this hence inside the plane to the right of the wire. Now once we've calculated the magnetic field here now it doesn't really matter what created the magnetic field it could be this wire it could be another wire it could be five different wires right now all we are interested in is this particular magnetic field. So from now on when we, whenever we will talk about one particular magnetic field we will just take the easiest case which is the analog of a single point charge in electrostatics that is a single steady infinite current. We know the magnetic field for this at a distance r will be mu naught i by 2 pi r and it will go inside the plane. So what would happen if there was a charge q here? What force would that charge q experience? Well first of all we saw experimentally, we see experimentally that if this charge Q is stationary, it does not experience any force. From that we deduce that the magnetic field does not have any effect on a charge if it is not moving. Then we did many different experiments, we moved the charge in different directions and saw the direction of force and from that we were able to calculate the result, extrapolate the result rather, F is equal to Q times V cross B. So the force on this charged particle will be Q times V cross B. If its speed is zero, if its velocity is zero, then there will not be any force experienced on it and it will stay here forever. Let's say it's going up with the speed V. Then the direction of velocity is vertically upwards. The direction of magnetic field is inside the plane. Using the right hand rule, we will be able to see that V cross B is in the direction of the left side. So Q times V cross B is also towards the left. So if we put it upwards with the speed v it will actually end up moving like this because it will experience a force towards the left right so this is the standard formula to calculate the effect of magnetic field on a moving charge and this is analogous to f is equal to q times e in the case of electric field by the way anytime you are confused about what the dimensions of magnetic field are this is a very easy step to see it the dimensions of velocity times magnetic field are the same as the dimensions of E and of course the dimensions of E you would generally know so from that you could calculate the dimensions of V. Okay. So now let's first look at why we see that the magnetic field and the electric field are considered to be part of the same thing. So let's say you have again an infinite wire carrying a current I you have a charge Q and we push that charge Q upwards with a velocity V and we see that it moves towards the left. Now consider two frames of reference. One frame of reference stationary with respect to this charge. Let's call this S. We have a person standing here. Another frame of reference S1 which is moving upwards with the same speed V as this one. Right. So for the frame S what we see is if this charge was stationary there would be no force acting on it. That means whatever field exists in this place cannot possibly be the electric field. And when we give it a speed, then it exerts a force towards the left. So charge the frame of reference S, the person there will see a magnetic field. Exactly what you'd expect. What about a person who's moving up with the speed V? Relative to this person, this charge is now stationary. So it cannot experience a force due to the magnetic field. However, even if it is stationary, it is still moving towards the left. See, you notice that these two reference frames, S and S dash, 
don't have any acceleration with respect to each other right because this is moving with a constant velocity so both of them will see the same acceleration towards the left s will interpret that as a magnetic field because he'll see the charge to be moving s dash will see the charge to be stationary so he will interpret the force as an electric field this is where both these things come into the picture together it's ultimately a question of the frame of reference what will look like magnetic field in some frames of reference may look like an electric field or in some cases if you are moving at let's say v by 2 then it would look like a combination of electric and magnetic field from that we deduce that electric and magnetic fields are two aspects of the same thing which we then start calling the electromagnetic field so right now we'll just focus on magnetic field and later on we'll see how electric fields can actually produce a magnetic field and magnetic fields can produce an electric field by the way the SI unit of a magnetic field is one Tesla but it is generally quite a large unit so it is often written as 10 to the power 4 Gauss and Gauss is generally the unit which you would see in questions so one Gauss is not an SI unit Tesla is an SI unit and one Tesla is equal to 10 to the power 4 Gauss right now let's look at what happens in a specific case when we are talking about a constant magnetic field and a charge flowing through it let's say we have a region here and that region has a constant magnetic field inside the plane of magnitude B now this is the advantage of calculating fields instead of forces because if we were to try to figure out what kind of currents would create this magnetic field they would turn out to be quite complicated so let's just assume somehow we've got a configuration of currents which gives me a constant magnetic field inside the plane everywhere within this region and I take a charge Q and I just move it with an initial speed V so what will be the force experience it will be Q times V cross B V is towards the right and B is inside the plane that is away from the viewer so the direction of force will be upwards right let's call this F we know that F is equal to Q V B now we don't need V cross B because we know that V and B are perpendicular to each other and we've already written the direction in this figure so what will happen it will actually start moving like this right and what we know is the magnetic field will always be perpendicular to the velocity so what magnitude will be constant because magnetic fields never do any work that's why they can never change the speed or they can never change the kinetic energy of an object right so if we have a constant force in this direction and that force is always perpendicular to the velocity then that force will act like a centripetal force and it will start moving in circular motion such that F which is QVB will be MV squared by R where M is the mass of this particle R is the radius of the circle in which this particle moves when this particle is at this point V will be upwards and you can see V cross P will be towards the left so at any point the force due to the magnetic field will be towards the center and since it already has a speed V initial speed it will continue moving in a circle so this is the equation and this shows us that a particle suspended at a speed V in a constant magnetic field will move according to this equation QVB is equal to MV square by R we can cancel V and we can see that the radius is equal to MV by QB so if you have a particle of mass M and charge Q and it is placed in a constant magnetic field B and we push it with a velocity V perpendicular to the magnetic field it will start moving in a circle right now this particular system is called a cyclotron and it is very often used to calculate the charges on particles in fact this is how the charges on an electron and proton were calculated but before that they were done by the Millikan's drop experiment they, this was used to verify them so you take any particle you throw it with a speed V you know the magnetic field uh, you know the mass of the particle you can measure it and you see experimentally what the radius is and from that you can determine the charge on that particle the greater the charge on the particle the smaller the radius will be right what will be the time period taken to cover this the time period will be 2 pi r by v r we can write it as mv by qb and vv will cancel so t will be 2 pi m by qb and mu which is the frequency of rotation will be qb by 2 pi m and it is often called the cyclotron frequency
And this simple device is actually used in many, many places in experimental physics where you have a constant magnetic field. We'll learn in uh, some later classes how you can actually have a constant magnetic field between uh, two regions. All you need is a circular magnet like this. And then between these two regions, you'll have a constant magnetic field. We'll see that uh, later when we study permanent magnets. Right now, we just need to know if we have a constant magnetic field and we throw a particle with a speed perpendicular to the magnetic field, it will start moving in circles. And this, pro this device is called a cyclotron. It is used to measure the charge of unknown particles. And the frequency of rotation for a particle is called the cyclotron frequency. Now, what will happen? when the magnetic field and the velocity are not really perpendicular. So let's just change the perspective of viewing a little bit because it will be easier now. We are looking at the same figure but the magnetic field is now pointing vertically upwards. So we've shifted the figure by a little bit. We throw an object with a speed v and it moves around in a circle like this forever, right? That is true if the speed v, the velocity v is perpendicular to the magnetic field. What if the velocity v were not perpendicular to the magnetic field? In that case, all we would need to do is separate this velocity into two particles, v parallel and v perpendicular. Right Now, v parallel, that component will not have any force due to b because the force is q times v cross b and if v is parallel to b, the force is zero. v perpendicular will actually act like a force uh, that will be in the centripetal direction and because of this, it will ultimately start moving in a circle. However, it will not just stay in this particular plane because it will have a particular speed upwards as well. So the general path will be something like this, which is called a helical path. Right? So it will continue moving in circles except because it has a slight component upwards as well, it will continue moving upwards and form this helical path. The radius in this case would not be mv by qb, it would be m times the component of v perpendicular to the magnetic field by qb. Right? Also, the distance between two consecutive circles is called the pitch of the helix. Right? And you can calculate that easily. All you need to do is first calculate the time period. The time period of revolution will be 2 pi r by v. That is, uh, this is v perpendicular. So 2 pi into mv perpendicular by qb by v perpendicular. That is 2 pi m by qb. This is the time taken to move one circle. In that time, how much does the particle move upwards? This multiplied by v parallel. The time multiplied by this p upwards will be this distance. So this is the formula. I, I would hope you don't remember all these formulas because they are quite easily derived from the simple equation qvb is equal to mv squared by r. Sometimes it will be v, sometimes it will be the component of v perpendicular to the field. right? So this is the pitch of the helix. Okay, so up till now we have been talking about a single charge moving with the speed b. But what if we had a second current carrying wire? Right. So just we'll consider a, un a uniform magnetic field in a region and we'll take this current carrying wire carrying a current i. Now uh, just take a note here, I'm not calculating the magnetic field due to this wire. There is already a particular magnetic field present in this three-dimensional space. I'm calculating the net force on this wire due to this magnetic field. So first I'll just take a small element of this wire of length let's say dl and if the current is i then in time t the total charge flowing through this particular element would be i times dt. Right? That is the total charge flowing through it. So the force on this particular charge will be q times v cross b. Uh, v can be written as dl by dt because within a time dt, a charge moves in a direction dl. So, dl by dt is v cross b. This cancels and we get the second relation. The first is for a single charge moving with a speed v, f is equal to q times v cross b. But for a current carrying wire, a small portion of a current carrying wire, it is i times dl cross b. And if you want the force on the total wire, that's easy enough. All you do is integrate this. I into dl cross b is df. 
the force is on this small element of the wire. You calculate the force on every single element, you integrate it, you'll get the total force on the wire. So Q V cross B for a ching single charge Q moving with the speed V, I into DL cross B for a current carrying wire in which char charges are constantly moving from one point to another. Right. Now what would happen if the magnetic field was uniform, that means constant in magnitude and direction everywhere, and the current was constant. The current is generally obviously constant. In that case, B and I can be taken out and all that will be left. Now I'm going to do something here which might make sense to some of you, might not make sense to other people who really think about it. But what I'm actually doing is vector integration which is not in your course. But it's a simple part of it so I'll just hope you trust me on this. If B and I are constant, we can let's say this integral is called I then we can actually write i as i small i integral of dl cross b right basically i am taking i out of the integral which is something we've done many times but also if this vector is constant i can take this vector outside and integrate this particular thing i'll not prove this some of you might say it intuitively but what i'm really using is an aspect of vector integration which is not in your course now integral of dl is very simple it is actually the net vector l which if you add all these individual elements what will you get you'll get this particular vector right from the initial to the final point so this is a pretty easy interesting result we get that if the magnetic field is constant then f is equal to i times l cross b now keep in mind what this l is this l is not the length of this wire it is this length from one end to another. It is sort of the a version of displacement. So if I have a loop like this and I want to find the const uh, the force on this current carrying loop in a constant magnetic field, the force will be the same as the force on this loop, right, from this point to this point, right, because we'll just integrate all these DLs and that will give us this particular length and we can just use that in I into L cross B. This also tells us another important result. If you have a closed loop like this, then integral of dl would be zero. You start from one end, you come to that end. So the integral of dl vector would be zero. So in that case, the force would be zero. So in a uniform magnetic field, the force on a loop is zero. Right? Now one important thing here is integral of dl is very different from integral of dl. Integral of dl without a vector from this point going through this line and coming back would be the perimeter of this circle not the circle but this figure right integral of dl in this figure would be the perimeter but integral of dl vector would be the displacement between initial and final point and that would be zero right so that's why just trust me on this if you have questions as to why i suggest you wait and until you learn vector integration in college but integral of dl is written as l and that can be taken out that's something you'll have to trust me on Right. So this is the magnetic force. This is the force due to the magnetic field on a current carrying wire. But remember, this is only true if this is constant. Else, this is true. And if it is constant, you can take I and B out, and integral of DL becomes L. Right. So now we've learned what magnetic field is created by a current in the previous video, and in this video, we've learned. Once you have that magnetic field, how will it affect another moving charge on a current? Right? Thank you.